together. And so it is. All righty, everyone. Good morning, and uh, and thank you. And uh, just want to give you a report. I hope everybody had uh, had a, a good and productive time last Sunday. I appreciate the time off. Uh, I was able to do some things that I wanted to do for a long time, but just couldn't coordinate it when when the family was off. But I got to ride my motorcycle around town, and I got to uh, to go up to the lake with our youngest son Thomas, who's a photographer, and. Uh, and we shot some pictures together. So uh, that was very, very enjoyable. So I hope everybody had a, a restful and relaxing Sunday. <laughs> if you read the first email and the second email I sent out last night, you, you have to chuckle at my absent-mindedness because I was absolutely convinced that today is Father's Day and the talk was going to be about Father's Day. And no sooner had I sent the email out than my son, who follows the page on Facebook, sent me, <laughs> sent me a message and said, uh, uh, are you aware Father's Day is next week? So I had a chuckle and sent out a, an email saying, well, we'll do Father's Day next week, and tomorrow morning will be a surprise. So I did what I usually do. I, as I went to bed, I did a treatment, and I said that whatever ideas need to be discussed tomorrow will reveal themselves to me, and when I wake up in the morning, I'll know what that is. And sure enough, as soon as my eyes opened this morning, as soon as, as soon as I turned over and looked at the clock, I saw what time it was and said, oh, it's time to get up. As soon as I did that, the phrase, the inevitableness of God, the inevitableness of God floated through my awareness, my field of awareness. I'm, I'm at the point where I, I'm trying no longer to say I had a thought because I can't take credit for thoughts. I don't know where they come from. They pass, they pass by me and I become aware of them, but I can't say that I created them, which is important because it's the same with the power of the universe. We didn't create it, but we, began, we can become aware of it. We can become aware of it and we can cooperate with the inevitableness of God. Now, as, as these ideas were, were kind of uh, formulating them into, into some, some semblance of a talk, you know, I pick up a couple books, I read a few things, I look, look for inspiration. The books that I, I picked up, and when I turned them open, and not, not in any particular order, but just turned them open to see what, what jumped out at me, the same idea was coming to me from different places. And it was the example of water. The example of water. First as a, as a, a symbol or perhaps even a metaphor for the inevitableness of God. And second for a movement within consciousness. A movement within consciousness. So from the East, we get the parable of, and it, this parable is used in many 12-step programs, we get the parable of the person who is out in the middle of a river, and they have found a rock, and it's not big enough to get up on, but it's small enough they can get their arms around it and grab onto it. And here's this person in the middle of the river, and they're holding on to that rock for dear life. And the current is pushing against them, and, and, and they're struggling, and they're fighting, and they're straining against the current. And what they don't realize is that it's the stream of life. That life is trying to move them forward. The entire universe is expanding. Life is expanding. The divine did not create us to be still in one place, but to unfold, to unfold in our, in our knowledge and in our experience and in our conscious realization of its presence and activity. So if we try to stay in one place, remember we talked last week about don't, don't get stuck, or less talk, don't get stuck. If we try to stay in one place and not grow and not expand and not move, 
move with the flow of life, with the stream of life. See, we struggle. We are creating a struggle where struggle need not be. And of course, the other thing the person doesn't realize is that it, it's inevitable. It's inevitable that they're going to have to let go. They can't hold on to that rock forever. It's physically impossible. Their body will become tired, but the river will keep flowing. And at some point, they're going to have to release, release, and let go. Many years ago, uh, a fellow I worked with uh, at Nortel in, uh, in Raleigh was into uh, kayaking but not the kind of kayaking that most of us would think of, which is paddling along peacefully on the still waters at sunrise or sunset, watching the birds take flight. Now, he was, he was into whitewater kayaking, rodeo kayaking, you know, these little short kayaks that they get in and they come down, they come down the rapids and they kind of hop that kayak around the boulders. And, and uh, there's even a, a, an Olympic sport in it. And there's a training center up here in Charlotte I'd like to go up and shoot some photos sometimes. There's a training center up here where they have a, a course where people practice. Some of the Olympians, there's a, uh, um, an Olympic kayaker from Charlotte who practices there. This is what he was into. So he was telling us that one time he went out to a, a, a river that he hadn't gone to before, but it was very, very popular with the kayakers, you know. And he went and he put his kayak into the water and he started down through the rapids and he was kind of, you know, hopping and dancing around the boulders as you see them do, you know. It looks like great fun, but, but I guess you have to be in good shape and very agile to do it. And as he was coming down the river, he realized that he was coming to a short waterfall. And he was going to have to jump. Now, you know, this was, this was an area where the kayakers went all the time. So he, you know, he knew that he was going to make it. <laughs> he didn't have any choice if he wasn't. But he knew that he was going to make it. But he was trying to pick the right line, the right position, how he was going to go over that fall and, and land into the river below and continue on. You know, <clears throat> Have you ever seen the, them do this on, on the, um, the video on TV? You know, some of them come off and they go down and hit the water and completely disappear. And all of a sudden, poof, they pop up again. And they just got that paddle going. They keep going. So he was setting up his position. He was trying to find the right place where he was going to shoot off the top of that waterfall. And he said then something incredible happened. Something he never anticipated happened. His boat completely disappeared from under him. He had passed over the top of a hole in the bottom of the riverbed. And he couldn't see it as he approached it, but part of the water was going down the hole and the rest of the water was going over the top of the falls. And as the bow of his boat went over that hole, it just, it just disappeared from underneath him. And he was able to get his arms out. He dropped his paddle and he got his arms out. And his arms were, were wide enough that he could reach the sides of the hole and he could press down on the ground on either side of the hole. And there he was, there he was with his head above water barely, but the entire force of all of the water that was coming past him was hitting him in the back and trying to push him down the hole. And he didn't want to let go. He said he, did, he had no idea what was below him. He had no idea how big that opening below him was. Where, where was the water going? Where was he going to go? Had his boat gone down the hole and become wedged in, in a crevice somewhere, and he was going to go down and get stuck right behind it and drown. And he said all of this was going through his mind, and, and then suddenly he realized there was no way. There was no way he was going to be able to hold on forever. It was inevitable that he would get tired. Excuse me. He would get tired, and he would let go. So finally he did. He said he had no choice. He said he just... He just gulped as much air as he could, and he, he tucked his arms above his head, and he let go and prayed for the best. And he said, to his delight and surprise, <laughs> in what seemed like an eternity later, he came shooting out from underneath the waterfall. The hole just simply went 
like almost at a 90 degree angle. It went down and then it came out. And he shot out. <laughs> he shot out and landed in the, in the river below, you know, and was able to find his boat floating nearby and his paddle floating nearby and got some help from the people who were down there. They got him over to the shore where he could gain his composure. So he lived to have a great story to tell. But to me, that's another example, you see, of the inevitableness, the inevitableness, the power of that water, the power of that river. He was in it, he was caught up in it, and it was pushing him along. When he was in the boat and paddling, he felt like he had some sense of control. But when the boat was gone, he had to surrender to the inevitableness. Lao Tzu tells us that water is soft and yielding, yet it can carve away the biggest boulder in the middle of the stream. It can make a hole in the bottom of a river and shoot it out underneath a waterfall. He says, Lao Tzu tells us then that it's, it's ironic that that which is soft is strong. And why is that, you see? Why is that? What came to my mind is when I was a kid, there was a riddle that, that we used to <clears throat> play on one another, which is what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable, immovable object? What happens, you know? And of course, if you say, well, if the force stops, you say, well, then it was never an unstoppable force. And if the object moves, well, then it wasn't an immovable object. But the example of water against the boulder shows us what happens. The water yields. The water goes around the obstacle, and the water comes back together, and the water keeps keeps going. It keeps its journey going down to the ocean. But over time, over time, consistency, persistence, over time it is inevitable that that rock will wear away. I mean, we can look at the, at, at the great canyons of the world and we can see the action of water over time, over eons and eons of time, just simply doing what water does when, when moved by gravity. It pushes along. Doesn't seem to struggle much. You don't hear it complain. Comes up against the rock, yields and goes around the rock and continues on. But inevitably, inevitably, that gentle flow of water, that persistence of water over very, very, very long periods of time moves that rock away, moves that rock away. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting some water here. Now the other thing about the symbolism of water when we, when we look into um, religious teachings, spiritual teachings, when we look into the scriptures, is water is usually a symbol for consciousness, for consciousness, see. The book of Genesis tells us that the earth was void of form, but the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters moved upon the face of the waters and said, let there be, let there be, and there was. So to me, the symbolism here is, is that the face of the waters, the Spirit of God and the movement upon the face of the waters is a movement within consciousness. Something moved within consciousness. To put it in terms that the physics, physicists use, something kicked the can to get the Big Bang going. 
Something started it all. And that was the spirit moving upon the face of the waters. Now, in other places, you know, in other places in the Bible, we see other stories relating to water. Moses killed the Egyptian officer. He wasn't emotionally mature enough to, to go about his chosen mission of freeing the, uh, the Israelites from bondage. So he had to go into the desert to the prayer life, and he had to prepare. And he started his preparation at the well. Remember that? He was at the well. And the well signifies deeper consciousness. It signifies going down deep and making our connection with consciousness, with consciousness, with the water. Right? Even the book of Proverbs tells us that he leads us beside the still waters. Waters that aren't moving so fast, they'll sweep us away. Waters that aren't moving so slow that they become stagnant and would make us sick. But he leads us beside the still waters waters, peaceful consciousness, peaceful consciousness, peaceful mind. When we, uh, when we uh, look at the scriptures at Christmas, you know, one of the things that comes up is, is the name of the mother of Jesus is Mary, and Mary is mistress of the sea, and the sea is water, is consciousness. Peaceful consciousness. Where is the Christ consciousness born? Within our peaceful consciousness. You see. So the symbolism is there, you know, and I'm sure other people will find other meanings to symbolism. But the idea is that water represents consciousness and the movement of consciousness, the movement within consciousness which is thought, is a power. Is a power that is an unstoppable force. A power that may come up against an obstacle, but eventually that obstacle must be taken out of its way. It must dissolve. When the unstoppable force meets the immovable object, it dissolves the immovable object. Remember this, it dissolves the obstacles. Now the other thing that we want to consider in this unfold, unfolding consciousness that we see before our very eyes, the universe, our own lives, our own bodies, all of these things, is we want to step out of our, our familiar experience of time as we know it, as human beings, you know. I mean, we measure things in, in terms of years, in terms of decades, in terms of centuries. But if we look at the age of the universe, it is, it is beyond our ability to understand, beyond our ability to experience. Billions of years, billions of years, you know, our lifetimes are, are less than a hundred years. And yet, there are things that have been going on for a billion years. I read somewhere that the photons, the photons of sunlight that are hitting us right now, began their escape from the center of the sun a million years ago. Now, I don't know how they know that, but that's what I read. A million years before you were born, sunlight that welcomed you when you first entered this world was preparing, was preparing. This boggles our mind. This boggles comprehension. It just, it blows me away, the vastness of the universe. You know, we look through the, the Hubble telescope and we see things that happened Billions of years ago. Billions of years ago. It took that light billions of years to move across the universe and enter the telescope 
and reach the eye, you see, reach the eye of the observer. But where did the realization take place? Where did the seeing take place? The physical component was light hitting the optic nerve or hitting parts of the eye that stimulated the optic nerve. But then what happened, you see? Then where did it go? And the interpretation of what we see takes place in consciousness. So here we have the idea that what started the whole thing going, the Big Bang, what kicked the can, in the beginning was, was void and without form, but the spirit moved upon the face of consciousness. There was a movement, spirit moved upon the face of the waters, which is the symbol of consciousness. There was a movement in consciousness. There was a thought, and that got everything going billions of years ago created that star that emits that light that travels for billions of years to be perceived by the very consciousness that created it. The very consciousness that created it appearing as an individualized expression of itself. as you and I looking at the images on the internet, as a scientist peering through the, the lens of the scope. Of course, that doesn't happen much anymore. They photograph everything. But just, just take yourself out of this little realm of familiarity <clears throat> of breakfast, lunch, and supper, and working nine to five, and, and all of those things. and consider the magnificence, the persistence, you know? <laughs> if we can keep up a good habit for 21 days, we're doing good. Light has been traveling at us for billions of years. and never stopped, never stopped. And what happens to the energy that is the light when it does reach us, well, it just simply converts right? energy. The laws of conservation of energy tells us that energy cannot be destroyed. It can only be changed. There's as much energy now as there ever was or ever will be. The energy of the water flowing down the hill through the dam creates the electricity. Right? And any electricity creates our light or our heat. It just simply changes. It just simply changes. We have a hard time understanding something that can't be destroyed, something that has no beginning, something that has no end, something that always was and just continuous, continuously morphs and changes shape. And yet that is the physical universe in which we live, which is an expression of the spiritual universe in which we live. Now, the other, the other idea or the other symbolism about consciousness and about water that came to me this morning from different sources, Ernest Holmes said it, and, and I read it in, in a, um, a book of Hindu mysticism. Just, just open the book. <laughs> just flipped open the page. Boom. Yeah, I'll show you the book. This is how thick the book is. I guess it's about a little over three and a half, four inches, maybe thick, for those who can't see it. I just flipped open the book. And there in that page was what I had just read in the Science of Mind textbook by Ernest Holmes. For teaching purposes, we are told to think of consciousness as being an ocean that is very, very still, and there's nothing in it. But as we start to think, little forms appear. 
Dr. Holmes calls them little icebergs. So we're thinking, we're thinking of a car, for example, and a little iceberg, the shape of a car appears. We're thinking of a boat and a little iceberg, the shape of a boat. Whatever we're thinking appears. You can, you can probably imagine this better in a, in a cartoon world, you know, where they have thought bubbles where people think things. But as, as we think, the undifferentiated waters temporarily take form, the form that represents that which corresponds to our beliefs, which is a kind of a deeper form of thought. But it takes form, see? It takes shape. It is the outpicturing of the thought. But then over time, as our thoughts change, that iceberg dissolves and a new iceberg forms, you see. And there's just constantly this, this idea that out of the stillness of consciousness, out of the stillness of the ocean, things appear and things disappear. If you put this in terms of the universe as we know it, energy becomes matter. But they're one and the same. Right? Einstein told us this. And matter is just energy taking form temporarily. And then it releases that energy. The form dissolves and it releases that energy. A, a perfect example of this, if you, if you think about it, are trees and firewood. So the sun's energy is bombarding the earth every day. And the trees capture that energy. And it becomes locked in the form of the wood of the tree. Over the years, the tree grows. It grows bigger and bigger and bigger. But we could think of it as the rain and the minerals of the earth and the energy of the sun temporarily being locked into form, the form of a tree. Now, if, if human beings do not cut the tree down, eventually the tree will fall. That is the cycle of life. That is the nature of life. The tree will fall. And when it does very, very slowly over time, almost imperceptibly, but, I mean, you can... I can go out to the woodlot behind me here and I can, if I go every day and I look at the, the tree limbs that are on the ground, it's, it's hard to, to tell that anything's happening to them. But if I wait a year and I go out, then I can see that they've started to decompose. You see, they're getting softer, they're getting smaller. The animals or insects are crawling in them, using them for food. And the energy that was locked inside that tree is now taking different forms. Some of it might be released back into, into the atmosphere. Some of it might be absorbed into the ground. Some of it might be converting itself into the energy that fuels the body of the insects. But it is slowly yielding back that energy, slowly giving back what was temporarily locked up into it. Now, if we need to heat our home and we come along and we cut that tree down, we let the wood age, let the water get out of it, split it and stack it. And in the wintertime, we take it into our homes and light the fire. We are warming ourselves with the energy of the sun that was trapped in that wood. You can't stop it. You see, you can't stop the inevitableness. Energy takes form. Form dissolves and goes back to energy. New forms arise. In Dr. Holmes' terminology, <clears throat> which I believe he got from, uh, from his studies of, of Eastern philosophy, we are surrounded by a sea of mind, of consciousness, that responds to us according to our belief. And as we believe, it creates. We don't create. 
it creates. And as we change our beliefs, this dissolves and something new arises constantly, constantly, inevitably. And here's the thing about it. You can't stop it. You can't stop it any more, any more than by holding on to that rock or my buddy holding himself across the hole of that river. You can't stop it. It is just the way it is. It is, it is part of creation itself. It is part of existence itself. It is part of this thing that we call God itself. Dr. Holmes tells, asks us to consider that, you know, what created the law? Nothing created the law. The law always was, just as God always was. God is, was, and always will be. We learned that in catechism as kids. And part of that is the law, the law. So, so what we get when we look at waters is we get two things, Jane. It is soft, it is yielding, but it eventually, because of the length of time, the persistence, the consistency, it eventually dissolves any obstacles in its way. It also represents creative, the creative power, the creative force of the universe. That responds to us according to our belief. That creates in our lives the conditions and the forms that correspond <clears throat> with our deepest beliefs. Now we have to be clear that we don't, we, we tend to oversimplify things. Dr. Holmes talked about this a little bit as well. You know, sometimes something happens in our life and we immediately say, well, what was, I, what was I thinking that caused that? Well, Dr. Holmes tells us, don't worry about that. You'll, 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 never, you'll never figure that out. Probably never figure that out. Don't get hung up trying to figure it out. Here's, here's the key thing to remember. See? What thought has done thought can undo. What thought has done, thought can undo. So rather than trying to waste time figuring out what in the world was I thinking, <laughs> you know, could add a V8, what was I thinking in order to bring about these undesirable conditions in my life? All we have to do is let those dissolve and let the conditions that we want gel, form, appear. And the way that we do that is by changing our thoughts, by changing our beliefs. We also get the example or, or the image of a mold, you know, Dr. Holmes used, used the idea of a mold in, in an iron factory where um, they, they take the molten steel and they pour it into some type of a mold <clears throat> and the steel then takes the shape of an I-beam or whatever it happens to be that they're making that day. We're probably more familiar in our lives with, with like cake molds and you go to the store and you're buying a birthday cake for the kids <clears throat> and they've got all different molds, you know, they got they got clowns, they got fire engines, they got all these things. And they just take that mold and they pour the batter into that mold. And the batter takes the form of whatever the mold is. Same thing with jello molds. You know, if you if you have it in, making a big jello plate for your kids. The energy that becomes the matter of the universe, the stuff of the universe. I, lo <laughs> I love it, Dr. Holmes is the stuff of the universe. How scientific can you get? There's this stuff in the universe. It takes the shape or the form that is, that is the equivalent of the totality, the totality of our beliefs. And, and that's important because we may not believe, be believing one particular thing, but the sum total of what we believe 
is there. And we are constantly, constantly creating these forms. We have ideas all the time. See, it's, it's as if, and, and we learn this when we try to meditate, it's as if we can't stop this flow of the activity of thought that is coming into our field of awareness. Now, some, some teachers say you can with enough practice over years and years and years, but most of us aren't there. We sit down, we try to meditate, and we're bombarded with this stuff that comes into our head that keeps distracting us. And it, it, it appears to us as if we can't do the one thing that we must do, which is to control or direct our thought. What thought can do, thought can undo. But we have to change the direction of our thought. Now, now most of the time we go through the day and we are not consciously choosing our thoughts. The thoughts are coming to us willy-nilly here and there from the radio, from the TV, from the people we're talking to on the phone. All of this is going on and we are not consciously paying attention to what we are letting enter our consciousness, which will then in turn create conditions in our lives. The Four Noble Truths of Buddhism, <clears throat> very simple. I'm going to paraphrase them, and I, and I know this is an oversimplification, but I, I just want to put it in these terms. First Noble Truth is, is that all life is suffering. Right? The, the condition of existence, suffering exists. It is an inescapable, inevitable fact. If you're alive, you're going to experience suffering, according to the noble truths. But the second one is that it exists because of our erroneous thoughts, beliefs, actions, and emotions. And the third one, the way I understand them, is stop, stop engaging in your erroneous thoughts, beliefs, actions, and emotions. And then the fourth one is, is to change your thoughts, your beliefs, your actions and emotions to better, to better ones, to eliminate the ultimate cause of the suffering. Dr. Holmes puts it a slightly different way. He says, in, in order to change our experience, it's not enough to just stop thinking the erroneous thoughts, the, the, letting the, the things come to us that we pay no attention to that come to us and then later appear in our lives. But we have to deliberately, consistently, persistently, stubbornly put in the kind of thoughts that are the mental equivalents of the kind of things we wish to experience in our lives. We not only have to weed the garden, but we have to plant the seeds of that wish, which we wish to harvest. Now, we go back to the river, you see, and the river is flowing, and the river is going to flow, and, and it's impossible to, for us to stop the flow of the river, you know. E even if you think Hoover Dam, I was just reading in the, in the news the other day that, you know, uh, the Colorado River, Lake Mead behind Hoover Dam, the largest freshwater reservoir in the world, or the country, I'm not sure which, is, is at the lowest point in its history. <clears throat> the last time I was there, <laughs> which was a very long time ago, in fact, the only time I was there, the lake was so full that the water was going over the spillway. See, we can put up an obstacle, we can put up a dam, but we cannot stop that flow. Eventually, the water will fill up behind it and spill over the top or go down the spillway, if there's a spillway provided. And if we extend that view over eons and eons and eons of time, if, if human beings are not around to constantly repair that dam, the unyielding, I'm sorry, the inevitableness of the action of the water and the weather and the wind will wear it down. And eventually it will be a tiny little crack and water will start to seep through it. And the crack will widen, and eventually water will push through that dam. We can only stop it temporarily. We cannot stop the inevitableness of God. 
The stones and the obstacles in the river represent the obstacles in our own consciousness. The, the things that we believe to be true that are not true, but we are unwilling to let go of. Our biases, our opinions, <laughs> all those sorts of things. But eventually they must go. See, eventually they must go. The river of life is trying to carry us forward into the conscious realization of the experience of the presence and the activity of the divine. And we are sometimes like that person in the river holding on to our obstacles for dear life, afraid to let go. So what we must understand is that whether we know it or not and whether we like it or not, the power that responds to us according to our belief is always working, always working. Not just working for the 15 or 20 minutes a day that we sit <clears throat> in treatment or, or prayer or, or meditation or whatever spiritual practices we might engage in. It is always flowing. It is always working. And just like the power of the river, we can learn to cooperate with it. We can build irrigation ditches to move that water across the field so that, so that we get better crops. We can use it to turn water wheels to do work or, or to produce the salmon wheels that we see up in the Northwest and up in Alaska, the, the power, the stream of the river turns, it looks like a little Ferris wheel on a raft. Part of it sticks down in the water. And the, and the, <clears throat> the current of the stream catches a paddle on this wheel and it makes it turn, but there's also a scoop and that scoop comes in and just picks the fish up out of the water. And as the scoop <laughs> comes up out of the water, the bottom, the bottom of, the, of the scoop is slanted and the fish slide right out into a, into a big bin on the raft. Somewhere along the line, somewhere along the line, in consciousness there was a movement that said, hey, wait a minute. <clears throat> that water's flowing one way and the fish are swimming the other way and we ought to be able to use those two things to catch fish. There was a movement of thought within consciousness. There was the outpicturing, the production of the wheel. See? So this inevitable force of God, which is constantly expanding, which has created the universe out of itself, which has been expanding the universe for billions and billions of years, it is constantly flowing through you, through me, through everyone. And it is taking the direction through us, the channel through us, that we provide with our own use of consciousness. Now the only choices we have are to ignore it and just let it do its thing and let the forms that appear in, a, in the sea of our life be just willy-nilly popping up here, there, and everywhere as random thoughts occur to us as we change beliefs over time, or we can recognize that we have no choice other than to consciously cooperate with it. And that is to dissolve the obstacles that seem to stand in the way. And we do that simply, simply, by taking our mind and directing our Keep your mind off the things you don't want. Keep your mind on the things you do want. Take all of the power and the energy that you have put into worry by God. We all know how to worry. You see, it just seems natural that we know how to worry. And worry is, <laughs> worry is using the power of our thought in a negative direction. Fear is a belief in the worst, right? Hope or optimism is a, is a belief in the best. Just simply take your thoughts and realize that you are the only one in your life who is accountable and responsible. You're the only one going to experience the consequences of what you're thinking, whether they be good or bad. <laughs> and you are the only one that can change your consciousness. I can't do it for you, no one can do it for me. 
but it is something that we have to realize we cannot do just a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit everywhere. We must be persistent. We must be consistent. Dr. Holmes says we must stubbornly, stubbornly endeavor to reveal the truth. Your job, if you want to call it a job, is to do the only thing that you can do, or the thing that only you can do, which is to take conscious control of your thoughts. We do not create the force. We cannot stop the force. The force is always operating. But all we can do is surrender to it, to the way that it works, to let go of that rock, to let the current of life, the stream of life, carry us forward, and we can, like my buddy in the kayak, we can shift our weight, we can change our mind, we can pick the direction that we want to go by changing our thoughts and finding that the entire universe supports us by moving in that direction. You're the only one. No one else can do it for you. Let's get busy. And so it is.